Good evening, Dimitang Sangonani Molweni, and welcome to this inaugural lecture. And a very special welcome to our guest of honor, Professor Hussein Suleiman, as well as his family and friends. I want to say a special thank you for sharing Professor Suleiman with us at UCT. He has built a solid global reputation based on his own work. But of course, academic excellence also depends on the support of loved ones. And so tonight, this is also a celebration of the part that you as family and friends have played in his success. My name is Mamu Kheti Pakeng. I'm full professor of mathematics education at UCT, but also currently serving as vice chancellor of the university. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you to my colleagues on the platform, virtual platform this evening. The Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Manu Ramutsendela, will introduce tonight's speaker. In tonight's inaugural lecturer, Professor Hussein Suleiman, Head of Department and Professor in Computer Science in the School of, of Information Technology. Professor Ulrike Rivet, Department of Information Systems, Faculty of Commerce, will deliver the vote of thanks. And also joining us is Professor Sue Harrison, UCT's Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization. This evening's lecture is very pertinent as we strive to connect the developed world and issues concerning development in Africa. COVID-19 has mobilized the world's scientific community, including computer scientists, more than at any other time in history. Investees are centers of gravity with, which attract researchers and new ideas. They give us the opportunity to expand the ways in which we intersect with the world and break down the barriers which we often which often separate disciplines. They often they, they open the way for research that is focused on socioeconomic issues and on helping low resource communities. In this fast changing world, it's important that we make valuable contribution towards the knowledge base in the field of ICT for development, as such as Professor Suleiman's vital research on digital libraries. UCT is committed to providing the conditions for academics to provide research that broadens our understanding of how to survive and also how to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution, which is marked by the fusion of the digital, biological and physical worlds. Just as gold and platinum are precious resources, so is information. But unlike our minerals, which have been beneficiated outside of our continent since colonial leaders signed agreements a long time ago, we want a more equitable and respectful interchange of our data and knowledge. At UCT, we are committed to doing all we can to help African researchers and academics beneficiate in this information resource so that their knowledge leads to positive change on our continent. I very much look forward to Professor Suleiman's lecture tonight, which is entitled Computer Science at Times of Crisis, Reflecting on Societal Drivers for Software and Algorithm Design. I was intrigued by the questions that he puts in his abstract. How do we build better software? How do we do this in a destitute region in an era of severe constraints and for purposes without instant or commercial benefit. How do we build software for long-term societal benefits? And these are some key drivers for research into alternative design strategies for software. And Professor Suleiman promises that his lecture will present decisive problems and recent research in the context of computer science and digital archiving tools. How are we gonna run this? session tonight is that I will soon welcome Professor Ramutsindela to introduce Professor Suleiman to you. And thereafter, Professor Suleiman will give his lecture and then Professor Ulrike Rivet will come in to take questions from you for Professor Suleiman to respond to. And then she will proceed to give a vote of thanks before I come back to close the ceremony. I now welcome Professor Ramutsindela to introduce Professor Suleiman to you. Thank you, Vice, Vice Chancellor. Um, I, as a Dean of Science, I'm very proud to have uh, Professor Hussein Suleiman as one of our uh, new professors. Um, I, I've noted that Hussein Suleiman has 
been interested in computer science from first year at the University of Deben Westville, which is now one of the campuses of the University of Kazul Natal. And he pursued his interest to a PhD level at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University in the US. It is where he laid the foundation for what would become his long-term research interest in digital archives. He has since applied his knowledge and skills in information retrieval in African languages. And I guess he has the option of presenting his lecture this evening in one of these languages. He coordinates the Digital Libraries Laboratory in the Computer Science Department at UCT. But he also worked for, he also worked on ICT for development. And these are the areas in which he has published widely, especially on digital repositories and multilingual information retrieval. His research focuses on the design of algorithms and systems for digital archives in low resource environments. And this is motivated by the challenges in South African adoption of the typical archival solutions which has resulted in much of our heritage being inaccessible or outsourced to richer countries. It has been recognized that the algorithms used in such systems do not cater for low resource scarce languages and local cultures. A redesign of systems and algorithms for the specific context of our low resource environment will arguably both meet the needs of local communities as well as provide alternative and potentially better tools for communities all over. So his work is not only beneficial to local communities in South Africa, they are rooted on the continent as a whole. And I wish to invite Professor Hussein Suleiman to deliver his lecture on computer science at times of crisis, reflecting on societal drivers for software and algorithm design. Thank you, Dean Ramutsandela. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. So, my name is Hussein Suleiman, and I want to welcome you to my talk on computer science at times of crisis. There are various elements to this talk, um, and we will go through notions of what societal drivers and software and algorithm design are uh, as, as we proceed. But I want to start at the beginning with a standard disclaimer. So I think I should say, of course, that these are my views, um, sometimes controversial, informed by my research. And I should also say that I'm a computer scientist. So please forgive me if there are any gross simplifications of aspects that are not primarily computer science, of which there are actually many in the talk itself. I also want to start by acknowledging um, all of the brave students who worked with me over my years at UCT and there's quite a lot of them, so I hope I've listed everyone here on this slide. Um, I want to pick on a few people for particular reasons. Um, start off with Leighton Peary, who uh, constantly reminded me that it took an entire year to convince me to be his supervisor and uh, promptly advised all future students that they shouldn't give up, which of course is very good advice. Um, I also want to thank Kyle Williams, who is uh, further down on this list, who pointed out at some point in time that my favorite word was basically. So I'm going to have to throw in a number of basically's during this talk and uh, apologies for that. I also want to acknowledge all of the honor students who worked in research projects with me over the years. There's a lot of people, um, but this is just not about numbers. A lot of these people um, have taught me things not just about myself, but also interesting things about society. 
Uh, I wouldn't forget a conversation with Marco Lawrence, for example, where he pointed out just how few students from Mitchell's Plain ever made it to UCT, which is a very serious indictment about what we do at university and makes us think about how to reach out to the communities in Cape Town. And the name at the right at the bottom, one of my earliest honor students, uh, Patu, who called me one day very excited about the potential for preservation of language in the region that he grew up in in South Africa. And in some senses inspired me to do a lot of the research that I've done with my students in the years that came after this. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first thing I want to start off with is talking about computer science and ICT4D, which I will define shortly. And then I will go on to talk about digital archiving a bit later. But let's let's start off with computer science. So as, as a first step, what is computer science? And I feel this may be my one opportunity in life to try to define this myself. Um, and I want to say that it's it's about design of algorithms. And an algorithm, for those who are not uh, familiar with this, an algorithm is a carefully well-defined process in order to accomplish something. A process that is defined unambiguously and defined to such a degree that it can be executed by a machine and still give you the correct result. An algorithm often also has elements of efficiency, so we don't just want to know how to bake the cake, we want to know how to bake the cake without taking the entire day to do it. The second aspect of what is computer science is if we can specify an algorithm so precisely, then maybe we could get a computer to execute this algorithm. And this is what leads to a program or a software. So I would say that computer science is about the design of algorithms and by extension, the design of software or programs. And the example on the slide is something that's probably unreadable to most people here. Um, it's a little piece of, of computer program that is written in a language that many people probably don't understand, but this uh, is the, the piece of code that would process a request that is submitted over the internet. So for example, if you type in a query in Google, it goes to some kind of server somewhere, and the first thing the server needs to do is understand what this query is that you have sent to it. And this little piece of code on the screen does that kind of understanding. So, what else is computer science? Well, I want to put this in a, in a bit of a bigger picture. A lot of people don't think in terms of computer science as being just one discipline, but computer science is one element of a number of related disciplines. So it turns out that internationally, we tend to think of the larger discipline as computing, or in South Africa, we sometimes call this ICT. In other parts of the world, the same thing is called IT. But it's a combination of multiple disciplines. Computer science is about the algorithms and software. Computer engineering is about the hardware. Information technology, we often think of as being the applications of hardware and software to solve real world problems. Although we have a tendency to just call all kinds of things information technology for various other reasons. Information systems historically has been applications in business. And software engineering as the fifth area was or is about the process of developing software repeatedly. So a clearly defined process for developing software. So these five areas have been around for a while, but they're not distinct. There are lots of crossovers in these areas. And if you had to ask me where I do research, I would probably say I do quite a bit of computer science, a little bit of information technology, maybe some, maybe some software engineering. And as a hobby, I do computer engineering. So this is rapidly evolving over time. And in fact, there is currently a draft document out there to say that we really need to define data science as the sixth area and cybersecurity as a seventh area. So this is a complicated picture, but within this complicated picture, computer science is about the algorithms and the software. So let's move on to the next part of the topic. What is a crisis? And this is the computer scientist trying to uh, do something that is not very computer sciencey. I also find that lots of people like to divide problems into four quadrants. And I thought that it would be useful to think of crises in terms of who they affect and when they affect people. 
The pandemic we know affects most people and hopefully some of the time. But there are other examples of crises that affect people differently. And we have conflict, which hopefully is short lived. Famine, which we hope is short lived. Poverty, most people are going to argue is, is an, a problem that occurs for, for quite extended periods of time, and but it affects some people. Climate change, we could argue affects all people and is going to affect us all the time. These are different types of crises. And when we think of these crises, we have to ask the question, what do computer scientists do? So what do computer scientists do during a pandemic? This was something that I was very curious about at the beginning of the year. And so I watched and I read quite a bit to see what research was being done. And I noted a couple of things. So firstly, drug discovery. Building software systems that could do simulations and help with drug discovery seemed like a wonderful thing to do. And there were some people who did this. I thought maybe I should change research area in March and go into this, but I realized that practically I was never going to become an expert in the time that was given to us in order to find a solution. Then we had contact tracing. A lot of people tried to build solutions to track people, and this became very controversial. It turns out most of the solutions were not necessarily produced after the pandemic broke. Then we had data analysis, where we were all quoting numbers in April, May, um, June about what was happening around the world. And the data analysis started to fizzle out when we realized that in fact, the data wasn't really of a very high quality. So this was a bit of a, a, a dampener. And social media analysis I noticed was also popping up on the radar. So lots of people were trying to figure out what was going on by simply listening to people on Twitter, by trying to analyze the data and detect some kind of trends. But what I thought was, we really needed to appreciate that there were two realities. Some problems simply cannot be solved by computer science. When you need to do a large scale trial for a drug, the computer scientists are not going to help you. And the second thing was some problems cannot be solved when they are problems. If you have not been working on this problem for a long time, you can't suddenly decide, OK, now I'm going to find a solution. So these are uh, reality checks. But what about other crises? So for many years, I've been asking myself, how do we as computer scientists address problems in society? How do you address famine? How do you address climate change, poverty? Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time wondering how we address unemployment, conflict. And is this really what computer scientists should care about? Or should we be doing something else? And so these are questions that are, that are quite troubling and lots of people have been asking these things for some years. So in 2012, I went to a conference in Manchester called the Alan, Alan Turing Centenary Conference. Alan Turing, some people may know, um, is considered by most people to be the father of computer science. His research led to the foundations of modern computer science and his work has been celebrated. There have been movies and TV series made about his work. Um, and so I went to this conference in, in Manchester in 2012. It was a very unusual conference. Uh, besides the fact that it was in a rather beautiful venue. If you look closely at this picture, I think I'm the semi-balding person somewhere in the bottom left corner. Uh, and somebody told me once that uh, two, one, one thing, the only certainty in academia is that you are eventually going to go bald if you are male. Um, I have to agree with that person now. But what about this conference? What, what about this conference was special? Well, at this particular event, we were celebrating the life of Alan Turing. It was a research conference. If you had a paper at this conference, you were not asked to do a presentation. You were, you were given the opportunity to have a poster in the room next door. Instead, Every talk at the conference was a keynote address by one of the luminaries, the award winners in computer science over the decades. And what came out of this conference for me was there was a strong sense that computer science began as a discipline around the time of World War II because there was a desperate need to save human lives 
and to end conflict. The genesis of computer science was all about saving lives. And so when I left this conference, I thought, well, clearly this was not something we were taught as computer scientists, but this is absolutely important and it's something we need to take note of. So the following year, I went to the ICTD conference that was held in Cape Town. And the ICTD is ICT for development. So it's the, it was the international conference on how to use technology to solve problems in human and social development. And it was an interesting event for other reasons. So the thing I noted, and I, I remember most clearly, is that pretty much every paper was delivered by American authors. And I couldn't understand what was going on here. Um, here were, a, this was a group of people from all over the world who came to Cape Town and spoke about the research they did elsewhere about problems that were in some ways our problems. And I thought, okay, this raises some questions. Who sets the agenda for what we do and, and why do we do these things? And so I went off searching for, the, for answers to this. There's an obvious answer, which is the United Nations, and the United Nations has the Sustainable Development Goals, and we all appreciate this because it gives us all a list of those things that could be considered to be critical issues for humanity to address. And they are the typical things, uh, poverty, hunger, uh, education, medical care. But it's not just the United Nations that does this. So it turns out that there are these interesting documents called development plans. Every country has them. Every country I've, I've looked for seems to have one of these. And these development plans, somewhat controversial. In fact, the United Nations plan can be considered to be controversial as well. Somewhat controversial, but they say all the right things. They talk about the things that people need in society. So they talk about education. They talk about medical care, safety, security. It mentions fighting corruption. And you know, we would all agree that fighting corruption has probably become far more important in South Africa and in fact in other parts of the world as well. But it says all of these things and then the question that you have to ask is if you look at this uh, from the lens of a computer scientist, somebody who, whose life is about algorithms and software, what do we do? How do we go about addressing these particular problems? And this is in fact something that there are no real simple answers to. So I want to argue that as computer scientists, we need to see ourselves as tool builders. It's not the sexy job out there, right? We are not going to um, we, are, we are not going to solve problems within specific domains. But what we are going to do is we're going to build the tools for others to solve problems, which can have a far greater impact because these are tools that a lot of people are going to use. So the computer scientist as tool builder is how I view myself. But I think at the same time, I want to say that there is this myth of the decontextualized tool that says that, well, I'm going to build a tool, but I take no responsibility for the tool. The tool stands by itself. How you use it is your business. I've seen lots of computer scientists do very unusual things. For example, uh, simulate a war game, a battlefield simulator. And you can argue that, well, this could be a game and the fact that you choose to use it in a military sense is your responsibility, but it seems like a very dodgy argument to me. This is not taking responsibility for what you have done. So what do I think we should be doing? Well, I think it's very important that we must understand context. And then as tool bu builders, I think what we should be doing is we should be enabling access, opportunity and agency. Because realistically, many people will solve their own problems, but they need access, opportunity, and agency. So things that we can do, for example, is we could make technology accessible. There's great examples of this out there. And uh, a good example would be mobile devices. We all know that mobile devices have enabled lots of people to think in about interesting solutions to problems, things that they would not have thought about before. What's increasingly becoming uh, possible is this notion of open hardware, where people can now build hardware devices that were extremely difficult to build 10 years ago. What I worry a lot more about is making information accessible. So access and opportunity are important. We want to give people access to information. And for this, a lot of my research focuses on search engines, 
letting people find information and digital libraries or digital archives, which is actually collecting information that can then be made accessible to people. And the third thing I think about this is, is education. So we need to enable education. So all of these things go hand in hand. Um, and you know, they, in some senses, follow Amartya Sen's notion of removal of unfreedoms. In many instances, taking an example of apartheid, people explicitly were denied opportunity. And so I think that one thing that we can do to change society is to enable opportunity once again and enable access once again. And this is where a lot of my research is focused. So to put my money where my mouth is, um, I'm going to talk about digital archives and how this relates to this larger picture, because uh, this is what I think is, is absolutely crucial to the future. So switching mode of it, let's talk about digital archiving tools. What is digital archiving? Uh, traditionally, we, we call this digital libraries. In, in an attempt to define this, I have two examples. So my first example is something called that we have at UCT in my department called the Computer Science Research Document Archive. This is a website where we have a collection of pretty much every paper that has been published, every research paper article that has been published in the department in the last 20 years. Except in a few cases, we may not have the full document for strange copyright reasons, um, but we have a full picture of the research that has been done and it's available to the public. Anybody can kind of go there and you can find our research. In fact, it turns out that if you search for the title of a paper written by somebody in our department, Google will send you to this particular archive. And this has been very successful. We've, we've did this pretty much before anybody else in the country was doing it. And I've spoken about this many times as, an, as a model for how other people should share their research with the world. The other example I want to talk, I want to use as an example of a digital library or an archive is the global ETD search. So another project that I work on for a long time attempts to not collect information but make information accessible. So in this case, what what I have is I have a computer that's back at UCT, which collects descriptions of the theses and dissertations written by students around the world every 12 hours. Every 12 hours, it goes to all the major universities and countries around the world and collects the descriptions of all of the theses and dissertations written by masters and PhD students. Does this very efficiently and then presents researchers with a single interface where you can search through 6 million of these items. And this is a very interesting way in which you can interrogate research. It's uh, in some senses, it's like Google Scholar, which does the same thing, but Google Scholar looks at a at a broader range of documents. But we do this without a lot of fancy software. It's a very simple system, and it's we can show that using the simple system, we can make information accessible to people. So in the in the example, um, I by using my name, I can find my PhD and my master's thesis done at different universities, but within one set of search results. So these are examples of digital libraries or archives, and I've done this for some time extending from my PhD. But more interesting in around 2006, I was consulted by one of my colleagues at UCT, Papa Scottness, who was attempting to solve a particularly difficult problem in digital libraries. She had a collection that's called the Digital Bleak and Ride Collection, and this was a collection of notebooks that were scanned and these images contained stories that encode the history, the culture and the language of the original inhabitants where I currently live in, in the West. UK. This is a very important collection. It has national and international significance. And what she wanted to do was she wanted to put this online. But she didn't just want to put it online. She also wanted to put it online and she wanted to give people copies on DVDs. And there is a philosophy that says that if you give lots of people copies, then you're enabling access, you're giving people access to information more easily. And so I got involved in trying to build a system for this particular collection. And immediately I realized that everything I had done before did not work. 
there was actually no known software solution for creating an archive out of this information that we could readily distribute on DVD and that would always work. Everything had some limitation. So I ended up coming up with a, with a fairly different architecture to make this work in a sense that it was not going to be as strongly reliant on all of these software systems. And this seems to work, and, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But after this project, the, the question arose, how do we do this over and over again? How do we create lots and lots of these archives? Because it seems like this is a useful thing to do. Making information available to people is useful, but how do we do it uh, multiple times? And I was at a conference in India where we asked this question. And one of my colleagues said that with 2 million euros in two years, you can build any system. And it was a very important comment because it, it made it quite clear to the audience that this was not the solution, that people didn't have this money or this time in order to solve their problems. We needed a solution that was going to work that wasn't going to require all these resources. So this was a while ago. We didn't have the word cloud back then, but if we did, we would have asked the question, should we host archives in the cloud? I'm not so convinced. If you ask me this question today, I would ask you, where is this cloud? There is no such thing as the cloud is in the sky. Um, when you talk about computer systems, when you, you refer to the cloud, you often mean that you're going to give your data to somebody else. And the question is, who is this somebody else? Who do you trust to manage your data? And are you paying for it or what's happening? How are they actually paying for hosting your data? So these are the, uh, questions that need to be asked, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about the cloud, but the thing that we really thought we should be doing is we should use free and open source software because free and open source software can be maintained as a, as a community good. And in South Africa, we thought, well, we could develop schools locally. So we use the free and open source software, develop the schools locally, and we could build lots and lots of archives. So I was part of a project called the South African National Electronic Thesis and Dissertation Project. We had a vision, and our vision was that every university was going to have a thesis archive so that all the universities would share the results of its postgraduate research. We would enable this vision by creating a community of skilled staff with internal training. I thought this was a great idea. And I said, OK, well, I will commit to developing materials. And I trained the first group of people and I told them, OK, you know, this is a lot of work. This is not what I do. I'll do it once and then you can take over from here. And we built a lovely portal and all of the universities created collections and you can go there and it, it actually works relatively well today. But the reality is that some people who got the skills then moved on. So people didn't get the skills and stay in those jobs. And then a, a, a really harsh reality uh, hit us where some institutions then outsourced the management to international service providers. So we started paying people in euros and, and in US dollars in order to manage these collections at our institutions. And we gave up on the notion of community and developing skills locally. This was a bit of a problem. It also had the other interesting problem that not everybody could outsource management to international service providers. So smaller universities are struggling to keep these things running. We don't have funding from the national government at this point, and I'm not really sure how long this is going to last. So this is a bit of a depressing thought that we may build interesting collections of information and provide access to people, but it might not be sustainable. So. This brings me to maybe my most controversial statement, capitalism of software development. I think part of the problem is, is this link between a capitalist view and what we think of as software development. And when I started thinking about this presentation, I remembered one of my old friends who said that in his first job, there were three programmers and 20 support staff. And I didn't think too much about it. But I always have to go back and ask if there were three programmers, if they were doing a good job, why did you need 20 people to answer the phone every time something didn't work? And, you know, this is just a, an, an illustrative example, but how much, how good is the job that we are doing as computer scientists and software developers? So last week I, I read this book called Bullshit Jobs. 
it's a in very interesting read. Um, and at first it was just about the labor market, but then at some, at some point in the book, Graeber says that half of all software developers have these bullshit jobs. The way that he defines this uh, is, these are people who are not actually adding value to anything. All that they are doing is cleaning up after someone else. So somebody did a bad job, and then you need another person who's going to somehow clean up after them. This doesn't seem like the right model in a time when we desperately need these software developers. We don't have enough of them. We are wasting them in a very strange mode of how we run this tech industry. So I'm, I'm trying to conceptualize how we can think of what's happening in industry. And my very simplistic diagram here suggests that we have industry, the tech, the tech in so-called tech industry. The industry has some kind of idea. So a company will go off, hire programmers. The programmers produce software. Software generates revenue. And this revenue then goes back to industry, which now grows. They have more ideas, hire more programmers, produce more software and generate more money. But there are also two things that are inputs and outputs. In order for industry to grow, we constantly need to feed programmers into this particular system. And similarly, if you produce enough money, then maybe you can generate a healthy profit at the other end. This is a very strange uh, system which seems to suck in programmers to produce money. And I think this has been questioned a lot. So this month, um, I came across this movie called The Social Dilemma. I think it's on Netflix. It's a bit of a controversy about the tech industry, but they make the point that the tech industry focus is on capital. It's all about money. There's no ethics, no context, no human-centric values here. It's all about producing massive profits. So I ask, what if we remove the profit motive? What if we don't have the money in that diagram? Well, industry is not going to grow as much. Maybe they don't have as many programmers, but your programmers are then going to have to innovate a whole lot more. And if you're not producing money, what are you producing? Well, maybe what you should be producing is value for society. And so I think there's, there's some, some value in thinking about this. So against this backdrop, Last year, I got involved in my latest digital archiving project. This was with Carolyn Hamilton, and it's called Emandulo. It's about digital artifacts that invoke pre-colonial history. And it's something I think is, is very important for South Africa, and in fact, for most parts of the world. But this project was something that came at a particular time when we were asking, how do we build these systems? So I started off from the the point of view that we need to think about the environment in which we are developing systems. We are in a low resource environment. We've already seen things failing and on the brink of failure. So we know that we can't simply use the same solution. But what is this low resource environment? Well, we can define this as firstly being poor countries. Most of Africa um, could be a poor country. We could also say that there are many other countries in the world that are low resource environments, but there are also places that are in so-called rich countries that are low resource environments, rural areas. I once had a colleague tell me that in rural Scotland, they have the same problems as the rural Eastern Cape. And then there are also organizations that simply don't have funding and don't have resources. And they can be anywhere in the world, but they're also low resource environments. So how do we develop systems for these low resource environments? This is where I went back to this Bleak and Lloyd collection and I asked, what is it about the Bleak and Lloyd collection that made this successful? And how does this compare to other solutions that people have adopted elsewhere, where they had the same goal? And it turns out that the principles are pretty much in common. So there are some things, and I won't go through the whole list here, but there are some things that stand out. Simplicity. We should not over-engineer solutions. Some people may remember when Google arrived as a search engine and its interface simply threw away everything but the single bar because the algorithm was smart, you didn't need a complicated system to interact with, uh, for the users to interact with. The third item on this list says internet or no internet. We need to think about the fact that low resource may mean that we don't have lots of bandwidth. Not everybody has a high speed internet connection. And even if 
the internet improves all over the world. In some places, it's going to improve more than in other places. So we need to think about this. Then I want to talk, uh, comment on the next thing, simple preservation or rescue. We worry a lot about preservation of data. I worry a lot about rescue. Rescue means that things have fallen apart. Your funding has ended. The data is sitting somewhere and your system, your server has crashed. How do you rescue important data that you want to keep for the future of uh, generations of people who are potentially going to access this? So rescue is important. We need to design for rescue. And the last thing I'll comment on is minimize computation. Very often with the systems that we build, there's a lot of unnecessary computation going on. And sometimes there, is, there are fancy techniques to work around the fact, but there is a lot of extra work. People don't think about this, but lots of software systems assume that we have lots of computational resources, and therefore it doesn't really matter how fast your software is and how much processing your software does. So with all of these principles in mind, I'm going to get very technical for two minutes. Um, there's a number of solutions that we can come up with, and I'm going to talk about two of them. So the first one is static generation. So I think that it makes a lot of sense for us to use the simplest possible way of storing data. A lot of people will assume that your starting point is you put everything into a database, but I think that your starting point is you first ask the question, what is the most appropriate solution? The second thing is you want to pre-generate all of your um, processed data as much as possible. So you don't want to leave the processing to the point when somebody absolutely needs it. And there's a number of advantages if we do this. The first advantage is that everything has already been processed. It's in a processed form. Your entire website is pre-processed. It's easier to rescue because if your software stops working, let's say your server gets hacked, which has been happening more during the pandemic, it's easier to rescue your, your data because there's nothing to do. It's already there. It's easier to back up, copy, etc. And it doesn't make your data inaccessible if something goes wrong. The second thing I want to talk about as a technical solution is in browser services. We all have these computers and in our computer, we are often using a web browser for lots of the things that we do. But how much of the computer is the web browser actually using? In reality, your web browser is not doing a lot of work. So why do we need a very large, expensive data center somewhere in the world doing all the processing for us if our computer is basically idle most of the time? Can't we shift some of the computation to your computer? And if we do this, if we shift the computation to your desktop computer, then the data center is doing very little. In fact, all it's doing is sending you the data. And then I have to ask, well, why, why don't you just send the data to the computer as well? And then you no longer need the data center and you don't need the network. So it turns out that you can change the model for how we build solutions to not rely on as many different pieces that are all costly in terms of resources. So putting all this together, I've been working on a project since the beginning of last year to create a new toolkit to create simple archives. I don't have a name for this. If anybody has any great names, please suggest them. Um, I've thought of local languages. I've thought of interesting acronyms. Nothing seems to seem to be appropriate. It's an unfunded project. So I work on this project when I have time. And I always worry about this funding. I don't want to apply for funding and then be tied into somebody else's agenda for what this project should be. I would rather have this project be something that produces software for the right reasons based on all of the things that we have learned in our research. It's experimental, but I think if this works, there can be implications for how we build systems. And it's strongly tied into this notion of resource constraints. And I think that if, if this is successful, at the very least, we're going to be, we will be able to solve lots of South African problems and maybe solve problems for lots of people in similar environments elsewhere in the world. So putting all this together, I want to reflect on, uh, on all of these lessons that we've learned. So reflecting on software and algorithm design, 
The thing to note about this, as a starting point, algorithm and software design, these are fast evolving fields. They are changing at such a rate that it's very difficult for a computer scientists to keep track of what's happening. But there's been too much focus on the profit motive and not enough focus on human values driven innovation. And this is causing some problems that are very difficult to address. So in the low resource environments in places like South Africa, if you, are, if you have a problem that is, or a project that is in the space of ICT for development, you're trying to do human development, you're trying to address something like unemployment. You try to address digital archiving and making information available to people. You cannot hire skilled staff. So I've been asked by people in this space, well, can't we hire some of your students to work on our projects? And the unfortunate reality is that the students are part of a system and that system is profit driven. And there is absolutely no way that somebody who's working in the space of building solutions for society is going to be able to pay the same as a private enterprise. So this becomes a really, really difficult problem to solve. In most cases, you simply can't have um, staff working on important problems because they are going to be uh, attracted to higher salaries elsewhere. But I think the, the solution to this part of the solution is that we really need a, real, a realignment. We need to realign computer science with societal needs. This is where we came from. This is These are the roots of the discipline. And we need to go back to what these roots were. At the same time, we also need to realize one size does not fit all and context matters a lot. I also want to reflect a bit on graduates in computer science. In my, in my position as the head of department, I find that industry wants lots and lots of graduates, far more than uh, the training institutions can produce. We cannot feed graduates in this, uh, into this tech industry endlessly. This is not working. We cannot produce graduates fast enough. What we need to do, in, in fact, is we need to innovate. We need to do things slightly differently. And we also find that industry has decided, well, universities are not producing the graduates, so they want to work on work-ready training programs. Uh, examples of this, I think recently Google said that it was going to roll out its own training material. But this doesn't produce computer scientists, it doesn't produce people who can do research and who can be critical about design of algorithms and design of software systems. We also see that in many instances, the, the industry that's out there isn't really supporting the non-commercial research. So we are trying to get lots more people to solve problems without actually coming up with better tools and better fundamental ideas. And I think this is a problem. And you know, if, if we really think about it, if none of our graduates or almost none of our graduates can be hired to meet societal needs, where are we going? Why are we producing these graduates? What are we really doing in our institutions? So finally, I think um, what we really need is more critical computer scientists. I think that if we had more highly trained critical computer scientists who were developing the foundations of the discipline in a deeply contextual manner, we may reduce the need for so many software engineers because we may make it easier for people to produce software anyway. We also need to go back to our roots and understand that tackling crises is where we came from. And the way that we are going to deal with the current crisis and future crises is by thinking about this in the way that we develop systems. And lastly, we need to think about innovation in a context sensitive way, but also realize that in order to innovate, we need better algorithms and we need better systems. And if we do this right, this is something that can benefit pretty much everybody in the world. So with that, I'm going to thank you very much for listening and I will hand you over to Professor Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hussein, for this really interesting and inspiring lecture. And as you can imagine, there's already questions coming in, but I also would like to remind everyone to please post their questions in the uh, question and answer um, uh, box that is available on the tool. All right, so just to perhaps I can kick off with a question. I, besides really enjoying your reflection on the developers that have to clean up after other developers um, and how that feeds the notion of capitalism, I think one of the important points that is being raised is the understanding that 
we continue to actually pay people for using software or we continue to pay big organizations despite the fact that we can actually deliver the software ourselves often cheaper better and apply it to our local context how do we create an environment that we make more known that this is possible that we even have these tools like you have these tools already how do we get people to use technologies that are actually available locally and so instead of using the big machines, use what we have created. This is, is, is a fundamental problem that needs to be addressed. So thank you to whoever has raised this, this uh, issue. Um, I think that it's a mindset change. We need to acknowledge that there isn't necessarily a better solution on the other side of the ocean. And that centralization is not necessarily a good idea. Communities developing skills. We should all be developing skills all over and contribute as groups of people all over the world to building better systems. We need to avoid any any attempt to centralize because the centralization effectively prevents us from developing the skills, prevents us from developing the industry and solving our problems ourselves. But I think a lot of this is about mindset. Thank you. Thanks for that. I would also like to, there's a very interesting question around the notion of um, understanding, I'm sorry, I'm publishing it now, understanding the interdisciplinarity and the interdisciplinary nature of our work and how do we create computer scientists that are more aware of the, uh, of perhaps how do we create computer scientists that are good at working in an interdisciplinary environment, but also on the other side, I think it speaks very much to this notion of how do we create knowledge within other disciplines of when to engage with computer scientists? Right, so I, uh, th thank you for this question. I've uh, pondered about this when uh, putting the presentation together and I wondered if I should explicitly address the issue um, of how computer scientists engage with other people I think this is a very difficult problem. Um, in, in the many years since I studied computer science, the discipline has expanded a lot. So what I expect an effective computer scientist to know today is very difficult to bundle into a three or four year degree. And this is assuming that you do absolutely nothing except computer science. The problem though is that without context of what else is happening in the world without, say, causes in commerce or causes in humanities, you're going to have a very um, one track view of the world. So what what can we do? And I, I must say I was at a workshop last year when um, I was ambushed, I would I'll use the word, by a colleague who said that we are doing it all wrong. We need to learn all about the humanities as well. And so the question is, do you build some, do you train somebody who is half computer scientist and half somebody from the humanities? And I'm not sure that this is going to work because I think that computer systems are um, becoming fairly complex and it's, it's really going to require us to work in collaboration with people. I think people need to work together where some aspects can be addressed by people in different disciplines some aspects can be addressed by computer scientists, but there needs to be some kind of specialization because the computer scientist left to himself or herself or themselves, they are not going to get it right. And this is what we've learned many times over, that if you watch The Social Dilemma, uh, just to use that as an example, if you watch The Social Dilemma, it tells you that here were all these people who were extremely smart, and 10 years later, they realized they were all wrong. And we can't afford to be doing this over and over again. We need to have active collaborations and not attempt to make the computer scientist the person who is now going to take all the decisions because they not just know everything about mathematics and computer science, they also know everything about philosophy, ethics, and society because that's never going to happen. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you. Just to perhaps also follow on from this. So this difficult discussion of what is that graduate that we are who we are producing um, or who grows through the university. And uh, Jean-Paul is asking, should a computer science graduate producing software be the responsibility of academia in the pursuit of their degrees? Or should it be the responsibility of NGOs? Or should it be somebody else's 
a responsibility, perhaps a business? Sure, I think this is um, a, a, an important question. I think this is almost the division between computer scientists and um, programmers in some in some ways. Although I think this is also rapidly evolving, so I, I'm, I wouldn't say uh, any, anything with too much certainty. But I think that the notion of algorithms as a theoretical foundation, this is a very academic discipline. And I think this academic discipline really doesn't get enough attention because people are too, they, they, they are too involved and want to leave, industry, leave the theory behind too quickly and move to developing the next great mobile application. But I think we really need to focus a lot on algorithms, the foundations, the theory for how we go about building better systems and better algorithms, and we need to do this at the university. Thanks for that. There are so many questions coming in, and I'm sorry that we will not be able to respond to all of them. So I'm picking the, picking some questions up here. So um, one of them states, I'm very curious about Hussein's statement about the need for more computer scientists. Surely we have a significant number of institutions churning out computer science graduates. Are these not sufficient? This is a good question. Um, what is the computer scientist? And I think I'm, I'm, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe it was missing on my slide. But um, what I was trying to say was I wanted more critical computer scientists. I wanted more computer scientists who think like researchers and who think about the development of foundational ideas in computer science, who think about evolution of algorithms in computer science. A computer scientist who's developing web technology and mobile applications for business is not actually developing the discipline. So what I think is that if you had people who are specialized in terms of the theory and who developed the discipline at a foundational level, it would contribute far more to the, the discipline as a whole and to what everybody is doing rather than simply having more people who are developing software. It's a bit of a subtle point there. Thank you very much. Yeah, there is, as I said, there is also, just to reiterate, there's a couple of colleagues who speak to that and a couple of questions who speak to that. And I think it's a very valid conversation to have in a long term, what actually is that person that we would identify as the computer scientist. So I think that's very important to, to think through when we give something a name, what does it actually mean? There's also um, another question, let me just find this. The, uh, yeah, the notion around the level of open source and developing our own software. What sounds like indigenous tools can academics and supporters of your approach really compete against the international giants such as Microsoft? So this is, uh, I think, an important uh, issue to address. And I, I didn't want to put this into my slides here, but what is Microsoft? Um, is Microsoft a technology company? or is it a business to make money? And how much, you know, we can argue that it's both, but to what degree is it a business to make money? And to what degree is it a, is it a company that produces really great technology? And I think this is where that balance lies. Uh, if we want to compete against the business, well, then we're fighting against a business and the business has a mission to make money. But if you want to develop better technology, then you're fighting against that person who developed Windows 95 when it crashed in the first live demonstration, right? Um, I don't think the software from Microsoft is necessarily all of a high quality. Some of it is great. We are using Microsoft software for this particular um, lecture. But I think you want to compete technology versus technology and not try to compete with the business and the marketing machinery behind it. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions, but I'm sure that anybody who has questions can also write to Prof. Suleiman personally in an email and, and continue with this conversation outside of, of this event now. Um, and I would like to now move on to um, the real honor that I've been given to offer the vote of thanks to Professor Suleiman. Um, and in light of that, also Vice Chancellor Dean Ramotsenela colleagues and students and honours guests, I, I was really honoured to offer this word of thanks. And I really believe that we have been given deep insights into what software and algorithm designs and is, means and how it's actually linked to society. 
So I would also like to thank you for reminding us that computer science started in order to save lives and resolve conflict. And I think that's a very important point that we need to reiterate regularly. So what benefits our society and how we within the field of computer science respond to the needs must be intrinsically linked to how we develop and design software and algorithms. I've been very fortunate in working for some time with Hussein, so um, I have also benefited greatly from his insights and his deep knowledge, not only in the field of computer science, but also in the academic environment as a whole. Hussein is a person with great commitment to knowledge, but also with great commitment to people, to his students and to his colleagues. And I think you saw that, um, you saw that by the mere fact that he showed his first slide was that dedicated to students, so thank you for that. His presentation reflects exactly that. Computer science is more than zeros and ones, and Professor Suleiman showed what it actually means in real terms to be a computer scientist. As you all know, a professor is a person who has something to profess. And I believe Professor Suleiman explained to all of us very eloquently today what he professes and what his commitment to furthering the goals of computer science is in the context of a society. Only through furthering the long-term goals of society will there be long-term sustainability for computer science. Professor Suleiman, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank you for your lecture today. Thank you for sharing your insights, your expertise, and for entertaining us by highlighting some of the aspects computer science grapples with in today's world. I'm confident that you will continue to inspire students and colleagues alike with your insights and commitments, not only in computer science, but society at large. Thank you very much. I hand over now to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, Professor Rivet, and thank you, Hussein, for um, an, an excellent lecture. Um, I'm so glad that you opted to give it in this format because it raises important questions about um, uh, your discipline, but about computer science and how it contributes to society, but also challenges us as a university in terms of how we can be a computerized 21st century university in the global south. So thank you for your insights. Thank you for the work that you do for the university and congratulations on your promotion to professorship. Uh, we are really, really blessed to have your caliber in our midst. All of the best for the future. Colleagues, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And, and thank you to Hussein. Have a very good evening.